So we're moving on in our biology course to chapter 25. Chapter 25 is the first in a number of chapters that go through the different systems of the body. So we're going to use chapter 25 to take a look at a couple central themes and a few um, concepts that are going to ground our discussion of the coming chapters and all the systems of the body. So there are a couple unifying concepts or themes, as I've just said, in this chapter 25. We're gonna take a look at structure and function and we're going to continue our discussion of this hierarchical arrangement in biology. So our course has a hierarchical arrangement in that we started with the teeny, teeny, tiny and we're gonna build our understanding up. The same thing goes for structure and function, or form and function, as sometimes it's called in the world of design. And so it's good design when form allows for the function. Uh, most people have rented an apartment that had a, a lousy kitchen in it. Um, I know I really appreciate a, a well-designed kitchen, one that accommodates the things you need to do in the kitchen because it has good design. The form fits the function. And in biology, this form fitting function is all over the place. There are so many examples that can come up, that you can come up with that fit this form and function idea. And again, hierarchy, we're going to reinforce that theme as we move through. There are a number of good videos on the Moodle site, um, and I would encourage you to use those to augment your understanding of this chapter 25. Um, they, they should, uh, I'll reference them in this video, um, and they are referenced in the um, PowerPoint, but they can really help to deepen your understanding. They're definitely better produced than the videos you're watching of me. Um, so yeah, those are listed on the Moodle site. Um, the first one there is the crash course. Um, and yeah, check those ones out. So the idea that form and function or structure and function go together um, is really important. And so most of you are taking this course, this prerequisite course, and will one day find yourself in a college or university course of anatomy and physiology. And so basically the two fields of biology being anatomy and physiology parallel this central theme or this concept of form or structure and function. So anatomy is how things are made. It's the structures of things, structure, structure of things, right? And that whole world is anatomy. So knowing, you know, all of your bones and all your muscles and all that. Function is physiology. That's how things work or how they function, how they come together. And so oftentimes anatomy physiology are partners in the world of science and in biology. Um, and we're going to just kind of take a minute in this chapter 25 to talk about form and function. The other central theme is that the structures in the living world consist of a hierarchy of levels. And so specifically, we could talk about, you know, cellular level as being the teeny, teeny, tiny. That's what I played with the font sizes here. Um, and then moving up to the tissue level, you were asked about tissues in your pre-reading questions for this chapter. We're going to talk about the organ level and organs make up organ systems. And most of the chapters that come to us in the second half of the biology course are, are each on a specific organ system. And then ultimately how those systems all come together to create you on the organism level. So just as, as an example of that hierarchy that will use form and function at all levels of this hierarchy, we could talk about, you know, muscle cells on a cellular level, muscle tissue on a tissue level, those tissues coming together to make an organ on the organ level. We could talk about an organ system being the circulatory system, and we could see how that all comes together to make an entire organism. Obviously, you are not a pelican, but this example could be done about a human as well as a pelican. If we were to talk about those base levels in the hierarchy, the cells um, making up tissues, we could talk about cells, different kinds of cells, making up four different main kinds of tissues. And the cells that make up these tissues 
are similar in their form and their function, as are these tissues are similar in their form and their function. And so we're going to talk about these different tissue levels. These are the ones that you maybe listed and, and did a little bit of reading and writing about in your pre-reading questions. So epithelial tissue, that's the stuff that lines the outside and the inside of you. If you did or looked at a cheek cell in the first lab, in the microscope lab, um, that was an example of an epithelial cell, so a cheek cell. It could be a skin cell. It could be a cell of your digestive system. Those are all epithelial cells. Connective tissue, that's a large group of different kinds of tissues. And as much as your textbook likes to classify things, I often think that if they're not sure, they just throw it into the connective tissue category. I had another student once who had just finished um, a massage therapy course and her textbook said there were, I think, nine different times, types of connective tissue, which is different than our resources. So um, we'll all be consistent with our resources, but there is a bit of a difference in classification here um, with different um, sources. Muscle tissue, so that's um, voluntary and involuntary muscles. So your stomach is made up of muscles, as are your calves made up of muscles. Nervous tissue, so that would be your brain and spinal cord and all of your peripheral nerves, all of the nerves that allow you to sense and feel and move would be your nervous tissue. So we're going to take a little bit of a time, a little bit of time, sorry, to go through each of these categories of tissues and talk about, you know, what they're like on the cellular level and how those cells come together always focusing on form and function with these or structure and function with these. The first of the four kinds are those epithelial tissues. So this, like I'd said, it covers um, and lines its organs and its cavities. So that's both the outside and the inside of you. Um, there are generally sheets of closely packed cells. So those epithelial cells that you did um, in the, the first lab would have been scraped off. They, they weren't stuck together anymore. They were likely dead cells, sorry to say. Um, but generally epithelial cells are closely packed because they are a, a main source of protection. There's three general shapes of epithelial cells. Cuboidal, well-named, are like cubes. Great naming. Columnar are like columns, great naming. And then we have the other. These are called squamous cells. And squamous are kind of like a fried egg. So they're sort of flat and blobby, if you will. I know that's not a technical word, but they're blobby. And so an example of a, a squamous cell would have been those epithelial cells that you drew from the first lab. So doesn't it look like a fried egg? Here, I'll even like color it so it looks more like a fried egg for us. So that's what I'm talking about. They're, they're a wacky name, but this idea that these are squamous cells. I tried to color the yolk yellow. It's not working very well. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. So in these, oftentimes um, tissues are are, are combinations of those three types of cells. So you can have simple um, one layer or one kind of epithelial cells, or you could have stratified. And so stratified means um, layered. And so I always think if you've ever been to Drumheller or anywhere that you can see like those strata or stripes, if you will, in the rock, that's what we're talking about. So these are multiple layers of potentially different kinds of epithelial cells. And same as always, biology wants to categorize things. So simple or stratified, for everything that lies in between, they're gonna say, well, it's kinda stratified. So that's what it means when it says pseudo stratified. So it's maybe not as neatly organized as a true, you know, stripy or stratified um, structure, but they do, you know, want to differentiate it from those simple um, structures or simple epithelial structures. Here are some images uh, beyond my fried egg drawing or me trying to draw the, the hills around Drum Heller there for you. So we have the simple squamous or the simple cuboidal or the simple columnar. Much like I drew you pictures, these ones are as long as they are wide. An example for a simple cuboidal epithelial cell would be the lining of the inside of your kidneys. And so we're going to talk about the, the, the general for or the general function of all of these, but they are basically for protection 
or they are for exchange of materials. And so here we have kidneys that are filtering your blood. They're, they're absorbing and secreting stuff all the time. And so that's what we're talking about with those simple cuboidal. The simple squamous, an example of this would be the air sacs of the lung. And so they would be secreting stuff, but the key thing that's happening here is exchange of materials. And so this exchange of materials is the function of these simple squamous epithelial cells. So here was absorption or secretion. The simple columnar examples of these would be lining your intestines. And so your intestines, what your intestines are doing on a functional level would be absorbing. They are also secreting stuff but mostly absorbing as you take in the nutrients from potentially your lunch today. Over on the other side, outside of these simple arrangements, we have the stratified or stacked or layered. An example of this would be esophagus. So it moves from cuboidal to the squamous cells. So different kinds of cells layered together. That would be stratified or the pseudostratified. So again, we're in the respiratory tract, just generally respiratory tract. And this is, well, they're kind of columnar, but they're not as uh, normal. These are examples of cells that are ciliated, like it says. Uh, we talked about that back in chapter four with the different um, uh, cytoskeleton or um, uh, components of the cells. If we were to talk about the next classification of cells, those would be, or sorry, tissues, those would be the connective tissues. The thing that is common about these is that, that oftentimes they are living cells. So these are living cells in something else. So the extracellular matrix is the stuff between the cells. And so if I focus on a couple that are, are good il illustrations of this, if we were to talk about your blood, your blood has red blood cells and white blood cells, and it's in, they're in an extracellular fluid of plasma. And so that's why we've got this idea of an extracellular matrix. So we've got red blood cells and white blood cells in that extracellular matrix of the plasma. Another one here, bones. If we think about bones, you don't think of your bones often as being alive, but they are living. You have living bone cells in an extracellular um, matrix of minerals and fibers, right, that make your bones strong. But you do have living bone cells in this extracellular matrix. So we've got cells in a matrix and cells in a matrix here. Cartilage, again, we have living bone cells. Some of cartilage is, is one of the more beautiful cells that you can take a look at in the, the lab that goes along with this chapter 25. So in your lab, you'll be looking at all of these different kinds of tissues and the cells that make them up. And cartilage is absolutely beautiful. So there's these little cells, again, in a, an extracellular matrix of um, collagen and other material that, that that allows uh, cartilage to function the way it does. So um, examples of this would be in your nose and your ears. Um, it provides shock absorbing surfaces around bones. Um, everybody knows uh, the pain involved when there's damage to cartilage in a joint because that function is no longer um, working properly or that are being served. Um, and so again, also in your back uh, between your vertebrae would be cartilage. Adipose tissue, so fat. Um, this is an interesting one because it is, um, you know, a, a, a connective tissue. It goes between, it supports other tissues. Um, and, it, and a key way it supports because it stores a lot of energy. It also insulates and protects your inner organs. And so in this way, it's a go-between. It's a connective tissue because it supports the other um, cells and tissues. Adipose cells or fat cells are really interesting in that they store a lot of fat and the actual cell components are off to the side. And so this would all be fat 
in an adipose tissue sample and the cell bits, everything that you learned about in chapter four, are pushed off to the side. The other kinds of connective tissue have the name connective in them. So we have fibrous connective tissue, so that would be tendons and ligaments. And obviously that's not hard to see how it connects and, and, and um, puts you together. So the way you can think of this is tendons go muscle to bone. So think of your Achilles tendon. And ligaments go bones to bones. So if anybody you know has ever blown their ACL, that's their uh, anterior cruciate ligament, and that connects bone to bone in the middle of the knee. Um, if you know anyone who's had that surgery, that becomes, or you've had that surgery, it becomes quite, um, uh, the anatomy becomes quite apparent. Loose connective tissue, I always think about this with puppies. Um, I don't know why, but you know when a puppy has too much skin, it seems. So, um, you know, loose connective tissue in you, it holds your organs in place. Um, and, and that's the function of it. So again, it's sort of that catch-all term here, I think, in these different classifications of tissues and different cl classifications of cells that make up those tissues. These are some images, kind of like we had before, um, of the different tissue types. And here you can see um, tendon forming tissues or under the skin. Remember, I just talked about puppies. So not only does it hold your organs in place, but it also holds your skin in place. Um, blood. So here you can have red blood cells that are stained white, which is very curious. So it's just a white staining. And red blood cells, or sorry, white blood cells, which are stained, that's why I've just made that mistake, stained pink or purple. You have a lot more white, red blood cells than you have white blood cells. If you had a lot of white blood cells, that's what's in charge of your immunity. And so if you had a lot of white blood cells, that might be an indicator that you have an infection of some sort. So bone cells, here we have an open canal, and then around it, these little bits, you can see the dark stained nucleus, those are the bone cells themselves. And so this external matrix is really what you think about when you think of a bone. The other kinds here, cartilage, remember how I said it was so beautiful? So those are the cartilage cells in the external matrix or extracellular matrix. And here we have adipose tissue or fat tissue where these are the cells. And so that would be all the cell bits and this would be the fat droplet or the fat um, holding vacuole of that cell. So we've gone through epithelial tissue, we've gone through connective tissue, up next is muscle tissue, and all muscle tissue is involved in movement. All muscle tissue is basically really long cells that are grouped into muscle fibers, and each cell contains a lot of proteins that are contractile in nature, and those proteins are called actin and myosin. We're going to talk a lot more about um, a lot of these tissues as we move through the different systems of the body, but specifically when we do the muscular system, we will talk a lot about muscle uh, cells and how those contractile proteins actually work. There are generally three kinds of muscle tissue in our body, and they're made up of different kinds of cells. So we can have skeletal muscle, and the cells that make up skeletal or skeletal muscles are said to be striated. Again, this kind of striping effect. I, I brought that up when I talked about striated epithelial cells, but these are striated muscle cells. And so when you take a look at them, because of these actin and myosin uh, proteins, they actually appear to be striped. Sort of like a tone on tone, like a, a, a gray and black striping or a pink and red striping. The idea here is that these are voluntary. So your skeletal muscles you have, generally have, control of. They allow you to move and they attach to bones with tendons. I'm going to flip to the pictures of these as I go through them. So this would be an example of an image of a skeletal muscle. Here you can see the striations, that subtle striping here. It's due to the arrangement of the actin and the myosin, the thick and the thin microfilaments of the uh, muscle cells themselves. And so those are striations.
whoops, striations. And again, these are voluntary. So the quick summary of these is they are striated and voluntary. Moving on to the other two types of muscles, we have cardiac, or sorry, I'll go to the opposite end of the continuum here. Opposite to the skeletal muscles, we have smooth muscles, and they're called smooth because they have a smooth appearance. You have this sort of tapered shape, so they're like a spindle, so that sort of like spindle on your stairs, maybe that's not what your spindles look like, I don't know, like that? Is that what your staircase spindles look like? That's why it says spindle here, because of that tapered shape. They are also involuntary, so the example of that would be your intestines, or if you have a uterus, a uterus is also smooth muscle. So an image of this, if we go to that, it's chosen your intestines here as an example. And this would be an image of the, the smooth muscle. And so you can see that they're tapered, right? They kind of smoothly uh, transition into each other. And so they're non-striated. Like I said, I'd go to the opposite continuum. And instead of being voluntary, they are involuntary as a quick summary. And again, if you think about your intestines, you don't control the moving of food through your intestines. That happens in an involuntary way. You don't have to think about it, generally. <laughs> So in between these two, we have our cardiac muscles. And the cardiac muscles are, again, involuntary. You don't have to think about keeping your heart beating. They are slightly striated. So that's why they're in between these two. And instead of being, you know, neatly organized like the skeletal or smooth in appearance, they are branched. And it's that interconnection that allows for rapid relay of information or contraction uh, of those muscles. And so here we go back to the picture. The cardiac muscles here, you can see that they have a slight striation to them. So they're slightly striated. Striated. And they're branched. And here you can see the branching of this one. And they're branched. And again, just to be con consistent in my summary, so they're slightly striated and branched, and again, they are involuntary. So those are the examples of the three different kinds of muscles. I like the muscles. The, the, the connective tissue stuff gets a little messy because it feels like that catch-all category. And the muscle, they're very, they're very much are three different kinds of muscles, and they do look quite distinctively different. The last of the four kinds, these are probably the hardest to see. So in your textbook, you have an image that looks something like this in chapter 25. So chapter 25 talks about the fourth kind of nervous, or fourth kind, fourth kind of tissue as being nervous tissue. They are similar in their form because they are all very long and they're very branched and their function is to stimulate, sense stimuli and transmit, transmit information. Um, neurons carry signals by electrical impulses, um, and basically there's other cells that support those neurons. So neurons are the key kind of cell that we're talking about, and this would be a schematic of a neuron. So a neuron has a cell body, which is illustrated by this um, larger section of it with the nucleus in it, and these branching bits. And so that's what's illustrated here. This one was from your chapter 25 of your book right? And what you can't see is this oftentimes in this picture or even in the other one that I'm going to show you is this long, long extension called the axon. And so because a neuron goes from here to here, they really are very long cells and they do bring those connections um, or communication network um, function to your body. And so this is the kind of slide that you'll see in the lab this kind of an image. It's really hard to get a schematic sort of um, <laughs> image when you look through the microscope. So at best, what you're seeing here are the cell bodies 
of the neurons. Some of these you can see a bit of a long extension, potentially that is an axon, but because these are cross sections of cells and cross sections of tissue, it's really hard to get one that is per textbook perfect and matches the schematic here. So that's the last, the fourth kind of nervous tissue. And again, trying to bring this back to structure and function. I love this slide because it takes all the words I've said and boils it way down to this idea of structure and function. Oftentimes, it's really good on these to come up with examples. And so for epithelial, they're generally packed, um, closely packed sheets of cell. The key job is to protect exchange or secrete. And so you could talk about skin, you could talk about um, lungs, and you could talk about intestine as classic examples of epithelial. Oh, kidney, we're in there too. The next one, connective tissue, that was that catch-all. And generally, they were sparse cells in an extracellular matrix. Generally, they bind and support other tissues as a function. And so examples of this would be ligaments and tendons. We could talk about blood. There were so many in here. Bones and a whole lot more. Just coming up with some examples can help ground you out to, to understand this and, and make those connections in your mind so you don't have to have it all as memorized facts. Muscle cells, again, there were three different kinds of the muscle tissues. Um, generally, their function, their unified function is for movement. And so in these ones, we had striated or skeletal. We had smooth muscle and we had cardiac muscle. And again, the last one, the nervous tissue, they're all about neurons. There's only one kind of cell that we talked about in your textbook. There are supporting cells. Um, we'll get to that when we get to the nervous system. But neurons are that functional unit of our nervous system. And really their job, so they're really, really long, they're branching extensions, they're long cells. And their job is to transmit those electrical signals or nerve signals um, for the body. And so there's not really an example of that. I mean, you could find them in your brain, your spinal cord, or your um, peripheral nerves. They allow the, the body to respond to stimuli um, and basically control its actions. These kinds of cells are key for the lab. So when you do the lab, you get the benefit of using the Google image search, which is fantastic. You're gonna see so many different kinds of cells. It's really fantastic. In the lab, it's a good example of how the textbook has these beautiful images and schematic drawings in the real world is not that neat and tidy. Um, and so if you do have a chance to come into a center and, and actually look at some of the cells, um, that would be great. The field of science that this is in microscopy is histology, um, and most anatomy physiology courses have a histology lab in them. So the idea that we're moving up in this hierarchy is that organs are made up of tissues. And so as an example, I came up with the heart. The heart has muscle tissue, obviously cardiac muscle in it. It has epithelial tissue in it as it's, it's lined with epithelial cells on the inside of the heart, connective tissue holding it all together, and nervous tissue to control the heartbeat. And so again, with these muscle cells making the heart beat, epithelial, lining the chambers, connective tissue making the heart elastic, blood was an example of a connective tissue, and then the neurons are the regulatory um, cells that allow the, the body to control or contract the heart. Another example of an organ made up of these different kinds of uh, tissues would be your intestine. And so your intestine, if we took a cross section of your intestine here, that's illustrated with this little square, we do have um, epithelial tissue and connective tissue. So this is your skin, this is the outside of you, uh, the muscle layers. Then we have 
uh, a more connective tissue with the epithelial tissue on the top. The lumen is just the inside of the tube that is your small intestine. A really cool part of understanding biology is, you know, this growing body of knowledge um, and, and the advancements that we can make with understanding this. In the last version of your textbook, it stopped short on um, making artificial skin um, in the lab. You know, we're going further every day in the world of bioengineering. Um, and so, you know, you can grow organs for transplant as, a, as an idea and, and limit the rejection in that. Other ones, and these were just pulled from the news a couple years ago, um, would be more bioprinting. So that's 3D printing of organs and using them. So here we've got an esophagus or a bladder, two examples in the news. Other ideas are nanotechnology, so nanobots to fight in an immune sort of a application, so immunity. Um, another one would be uh, understanding the nervous system, so uh, brain control of a prosthetic. So if someone does have an amputation, um, being able to come up with a way for the brain to control that would be a pretty awesome advancement. There's probably lots of others out there. I'll throw the floor open to any of those ideas in class. You know, take a couple minutes here. The, the, rest, the last part of the course does go through all of the systems of the body. And so there's a great introduction to the systems of the body in the videos on the Moodle site. Any of the organ systems that are listed here in red are ones that we're going to study in the course. And so we will talk about the excretory or ex excretory. I say excretory system. That's your kidney and your bladder. Uh, lymphatic and immune systems, I think maybe one of the frontiers of science in understanding our health and wellness. Um, and so we'll talk about how those go together and how they function. Reproductive system, obviously important, usually of great interest um, to folks taking this course, but unfortunately we are not covering it. The digestive system, um, usually we're acutely aware of this. Oftentimes if class is in the afternoon, you have either just skipped lunch or you are digesting your lunch. And so there's lots to talk and think about, talk about and think about. Uh, the nervous system, controlling the body's functions, either you're, um, you're aware of it or you're not. So we have the autonomic nervous system. I was talking about those involuntary controls. We'll talk more about nervous tissue and how your body transmits those electrical sig signals. The endocrine system, again, unfortunately that one is not in red in the notes. Um, that is all of the chemical messengers of your body. So hormones factor into that. And again, talking about the frontiers of science, if we could understand all of those chemicals that are raging around our body, I think we could really make some serious advancements in in the fields of um, uh, mental health and wellness for humans. Skeletal and the muscular systems, they're lumped together in our notes. The musculoskeletal system uh, basically supports and moves the body. The circulatory system, that would be your heart um, transporting everything that needs to be transported. It's central to a lot of the other systems and the respiratory system, which would be that exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide um, to support cellular respiration that we've already talked about. The last ones that are noted on these slides are the integumentary system. Again, not in red, we're not covering that. That's your skin, hair, nails, um, all of that stuff that's outside of these systems. And just to prove that, or, or support the idea that science is still evolving, um, there was potentially a new system. So the interstitium um, as a new system, and that's everything in between the cells. Um, and so again, you don't have to know much about it, but just that idea that our understanding of these is always changing. So I always put these pictures in because they're just super cute. Um, you can stop the video now if you don't want to, to listen to me on them, but they really do just give you an image of these different systems. And a lot of these systems you can see are working together. Um, they're also hilarious pictures, I think. Uh, definitely worth mocking a little, and we can do that in class. Check out the skeletal system guy.
Isn't that hilarious? And, and, and muscular skeletal is making the moves on integumentary system person. And so sweet. Circulatory and respiratory system are out for a run together. Totally appropriate. So that's the end of the first video. We'll come back and finish up this chapter 25.